Today's edition of Mac Voices is supported by Mac Voices Magazine, our free Flipboard magazine that brings you some of the best Mac, iPhone, and iPad productivity tips on the web. High in signal, low in noise, just like Mac Voices, Mac Voices Magazine includes information on how you can get more out of your Apple technology. Subscribe at macvoices.com slash magazine or search for Mac Voices Magazine on Flipboard. Welcome to Mac Voices. This is the talk of the Apple community, and I'm Chuck Joyner. Folks, this time around, we're going to talk about Apple TV. This time, we're going to talk to Mr. Josh Centers, because Josh has updated his book, Take Control of Apple TV, with a revision with all the latest information. And it seems like a perfect time to delve in a little bit into uh, Apple's Apple TV and what it can do and how we all like it. Josh, it's great to have you. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me back, Chuck. It's always a pleasure. It's always a pleasure. So you decided to put out a revision to uh, to this particular book, um, and that usually means when you guys revise a book, even if there aren't a lot of updates, it means there's some significant updates or changes to the device uh, so that you can keep the book current so that somebody that walks into uh, to whatever their big box store is and picks one of these things up has a resource that is current. So what's what's new with Apple TV? Um, sadly, sadly to say, not a whole lot. Um, the, I mean, we had, we had a major software revision, which is what prompted the book update. Um, unfortunately, you, you know, in all the years I've been following Apple, this is probably the least significant major software update I have ever seen. Like the, the list of new stuff and a lot of it is stuff that isn't even, you know, with tvOS 11, it's, um, it's very minor. <laughs> I hate to be a downer about it, uh, but uh, probably the biggest thing to happen to Apple TV in the past year, based on uh, comments from Tidbits readers, is the fact that there is an Amazon Prime uh, video app now, which is uh, some huge news, and it's integrated with the TV app, which uh, which is great because you know a, a lot of us are Prime members, um, whether we necessarily want to be or not, and so at least. You get uh, you get all that you know the t- extra TV stuff, and they have some good shows on there. Um, so TVOS 11 is a thing. It came out uh, last fall. Um, n- not a ton of development. Of course, the big thing though is Apple TV 4K. That's the the big big thing um, that's changed since I last updated the book. So we had the fourth generation Apple TV, and that for unfathomable reasons, uh, was stuck at 1080p. And so Apple released um, this new 4K model that does uh, 4K resolution, if you have a compatible TV, and HDR color um, in a couple of different standards. There's like HDR10, Dolby Vision, it can do both of those. And, And probably, honestly, the biggest thing that Apple has done that I find exciting with this space is they have, um, uh, for a lot of movies, they have added free updates to 4K and HDR. Um, I mean, I shouldn't say they. It's really more like they worked at deals with the Hollywood studios. Apple didn't really do the conversions themselves. So, But in a lot of cases, if you own the high-def version of a movie, um, you will get uh, the 4K HDR version for free. Oddly enough, that doesn't apply to Disney movies. Disney and Apple have always been very tight, but for some reason – uh, Disney's holding back on that, probably because Disney's planning their own streaming service uh, here in the next year or two. So I'm guessing their plan is probably to make that exclusive to their service. Um, another big thing, and this is outside of Apple, but another big thing that's happened is that Hollywood. Um, so Disney had a service called Disney Movies Anywhere, and uh, it worked only with Disney movies. Um, so the way that works is uh, you 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 know, you link your accounts together, you link through Disney. So you linked, uh, iTunes and Google and, uh, uh, Amazon, you know, all, all the big players, you link them together through your Disney account. Well, they dropped that system and Hollywood adopt the most of the major studios adopted, uh, this movies anywhere model. And, um, so now you have this system where, uh, most of your major, uh, Hollywood movies. Uh, you can link. You can go to moviesanywhere.com, create an account. They also have a, an iOS app, and uh, you can link your accounts together, and it transfers your movie purchases. So if you uh, bought something through iTunes and you want to watch it on a Chromecast or an Android TV or a Fire TV 
or something like that, you can do that. If you bought something, a movie through Amazon and want to watch it through Apple TV, you can do that. And, and you also get that free 4K HDR upgrade. So those are some big things that I touch on in the book. As for tvOS itself, uh, tvOS 11 itself, it's honestly kind of a dud of an update. Uh, supposedly, like the big thing that it was supposed to include is AirPlay 2, but uh, it still hasn't shipped uh, months after it was promised. Even now that the HomePod is out, we still don't have AirPlay 2. So um, I'll have to update the book again when that comes out. Um, so, uh, But now some of the things in tvOS 11, uh, you have de facto, you have built-in AirPod support. So you don't have to sync AirPods via Bluetooth. That happens through iCloud, like with the rest of your Apple devices. Uh, let's see. You have uh, automatic appearance switching. It can go between light and dark modes based on time of day. Uh, one big feature is a feature Apple calls one home screen. And what that does is if you have uh, you set up a second Apple TV, it puts all the apps on on the second Apple TV that you have in your first and in the same order, you know, and all that. Which um, I've had some trouble with it actually because at one point uh, uh, my Apple TV 4K started just installing a bunch of apps I had just deleted, like it just flaked out. <laughs> so I was having to go through and delete all those again. Um, but I, I can rant about that later. And there's a few other little tweaks. Um, so that's really the the survey of in the past year or so what's changed with Apple TV. There's the new 4K models. Uh, which are which are kind of neat, although they're kind of also over, very overpriced. Uh, you have the Movies Anywhere service, which keeps makes it so you're not locked into Apple TV or Fire TV or any of this stuff as much as you used to be. And uh, TVOS 11, which has some nice new things. Josh, you started out with with saying that the Amazon um, Prime app is available, and I, I look at that and I think, okay. Apple has done a really good job of getting, and I, and some of this is beyond their control because if somebody doesn't want to put an app for their service on Apple TV, they're not going to do it. Mm -hmm. And yet we finally got YouTube, we finally got Amazon Prime, um, we got Netflix, you know, we got the major players all on Apple TV. I can't decide whether Apple deserves credit for that or whether these services woke up and said, you know, this is a set-top box that people want to use and, and are using and we better be there or else. And, and that, that sounds a little dramatic, but I, I have to wonder because with with more and more things coming out about cord cutting, and, and even I hear more and more people that I would consider uh, my, my normal friends, not my geek friends or my tech friends, expressing more and more frustration with the constantly rising prices of the cable services, they're all looking for options. And Apple TV is starting to feel like a pretty viable option. Right. Well, you know, I don't think Apple honestly has a ton of leverage in this area. My understanding is Apple's in a square fourth place, uh, probably due to how expensive the Apple, t the newer Apple TVs are. And also you have a lot of people, um, smart TVs have gotten pretty good. I helped my in-laws buy a TCL with Roku built in. It was like a 55 inch 4K set, beautiful picture. Um, it was uh, $333 after tax. Now, that was a Black Friday deal, but still, that that's pretty remarkable. And the Roku software is excellent. You know, I, back when I first wrote this Apple TV book, and that was for the third generation Apple TV, Roku was garbage. It looked like something from DOS. You know, I mean, it just, <laughs> you know, anyone, anyone who used the Roku from that time knows what I'm talking about. Like things like asterisks on the screen and like yellow text on a blue background is look, look very DOS like for some reason. I, I don't know. It was very strange, but, um, so nowadays, uh, you have all these different platforms and they're kind of at the point where they're interchangeable, right? There's most of the apps are the same on each. So you have big players, like you have Apple TV, you have Android TV, which is built into a lot of TV sets like my Sony, uh, you have Roku, which is uh, probably the most popular in this space, and it well probably second to Amazon at this point for marketing reasons. But that's built into a lot of TVs, and of course Amazon has their Fire TV stuff. A lot of people love those Fire TV sticks. Um, I, I think they're terrible. I bought one recently, but they're very popular. And well, one of the reasons they're popular is because people can hack them and put pirated stuff on them. But that's that's probably another show. Um, so uh, another big, <laughs> another thing that's changed, 
a lot, um, and uh, not necessarily in the past year, but it's becoming more prevalent, is that there are more of these what they call over-the-top TV services. And uh, one that just recently arrived on Apple TV is uh, YouTube TV, which is, of course, Google's effort in this space. And uh, I've tried it. I, I reviewed it for tidbits. I, I'm quite fond of it, actually. It's, uh, it has a very clean interface. Um, it's the only one of these services that has all the local channels in my viewing area. Uh, your mileage will vary there, of course. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just generally a pleasant experience. And you have so much competition in this market now because you're no longer stuck to the local cable company. You're no longer st- or, or uh, Dish or DirecTV, which can also get ridiculous. Um, you can do things like you have Sling TV, you have PlayStation View, you have YouTube TV, Hulu Live, um, FUBU. Fubo TV, I think, is one. There, there's all kinds of these little services. I don't know why Apple doesn't have one yet, but um, they're all over the place. And you know, and, and that's really only if you watch news and sports, you know, live events. If you, if you don't care about that stuff, if you just watch pre-scripted, your your options are limitless. Um, so it, it, you have a healthier market now than you probably ever have. Okay, but that that leads to the question. Uh, with all the services you just named, and there are more out there, because I know I, I occasionally. I by the way, I also bought a TCL, the sixty-five inch version, for an, a, a crazy price, a great price. I seldom use the Roku stuff. I mean, I've played played with it, but it's not my favorite. I guess I'm still too steeped in the Apple ecosystem, but I, I know how to use that. I know kind of where things are. Um, but but Josh. Can all this stuff survive? Is there enough advertising revenue? Is there are there enough subscriptions out there for these things not to shake out a bunch of the smaller players? Well, yeah, I think at some point eventually uh, you're you're probably gonna get reduced down to just a handful of platforms. I mean, now stuff like I mean, let's be very clear: things like Chromecast, Apple TV, they're not going anywhere ever because Apple and Google could lose a billion dollars on them every year and. They'd still have every reason to keep them around. Um, Roku is an interesting one because it's a standalone company, and uh, so that could go any way. I mean, either way, I think they have exceptional leadership. Their stock does really well, but um, yeah, that's that's more of a question mark. Um, now, when it comes to these services um, like Sling TV, Direct TV Now, stuff like that, it, it's a li- it's a little more up in the air. Um, I think it's a lot like. In the early days of the PC, or the early days of the smartphone, when you had so many different options in the market and they're all different, I think eventually some of them are going to collapse or get folded back into something. Um, so, for instance, Sling is owned by Dish. Uh, I think they're just called Dish now. They used to be Dish Network. I'll just say Dish Network because just saying Dish sounds weird. Um, DirecTV now, of course, is owned by DirecTV. Um, Comcast, I think, has one of their own services, but there's, I think you have to be on Comcast Internet to use it. Um, so we're just going to have to see how that market shakes out, um, and it's going to be impossible to tell. Now, something to watch, and this is something people always complain to me about whenever I talk about these services. They say, well, yeah, I can do that, but then Comcast, you know, I have a data cap on my Comcast. It's, it's always Comcast with this stuff. And, and that's a fair point, and that's one of the you know the chips Comcast holds. But see, even Comcast knows that they're not going to be in selling TV service direct to your door forever. They know they're not, and you know, and the one thing Comcast and these companies are so deathly afraid of is being a dumb pipe. Comcast doesn't want to just be the company that lays uh, coaxial and fiber in the ground and you pay for that service. No, they want to sell you value added stuff they want you to be to love the comcast brand or you know just whatever um so uh data caps are a stop yet measure but you know th- their long-term play is they bought nbc universal right so now they own all this ip they own content they own movies they own you know all these different tv shows stuff like that so in the long, so and that's why i think in the long run Comcast knows that that business won't hold. And they know this data cap thing won't hold forever. Because, I mean, what, it's one terabyte now. I probably blast through one terabyte a month. Uh, most people aren't there yet. But sooner or later, you got enough people doing it. And see, it used to be when Comcast started this, it was like 300 gigabytes. And, of course, people th- blew through that too fast. They blew through it fast enough. People were complaining loudly enough that it wasn't worth the overage fees for Comcast. So at one point... 
do they get to where you know they just have to drop it entirely? I I don't know. Um, but we're also seeing on the horizon 5G uh, mobile networks, which uh, have a lot of promise um, in terms of increased bandwidth. You know, sooner or later, they know that that market is going to give. The, the the data caps always kind of crack me up because I, I get notifications and happily at the moment I don't have a data cap in, in my part of the country with Comcast. But you get the, you get these notifications that there's a data cap coming and in the you know in the next email it's like and we've increased your speed. And it's like, okay, so I can I can blast through my data cap faster. I, you know, it's exactly I mean, yes, I want the speed because I want the responsiveness, but you are encouraging me to use your service and use it to the fullest because it's so fantastic. And then you're gonna put a data cap on me. And you know, and and I have not heard, I don't know, maybe you know, that with the data caps, I mean, okay, so if I hit my one terabyte or whatever it is, then what happens? Do I can I buy another terabyte for an additional price or do they just cut me off or throttle me or how does it work right now? Um, well, the way it worked when I was, unfortunately, with Comcast is that they would add, add an extra 50 bucks to your bill and add like an extra 50 gigabytes of data. I don't know exactly how much it is now under the, the new regime. Um, but that's basically how it would work. They would just tack on more to your bill. And once I got, I had a two hundred dollar internet bill one month. I was like, yeah, this this has to stop. I ended up switching to Comcast Business, which had no cap. Now I think Comcast Commercial offers an option for like thirty bucks a month. You can go unlimited, which oddly enough, thirty bucks a month is about the price of a basic cable package. Hmm. Um, so. <laughs> That's probably the smarter option because I can tell you from experience, canceling Comcast business practically takes an act of Congress. In fact, at one point, I was like emailing representatives and emailing executives of the company, and they finally just gave in because um, they, even though my contract was was used up, they were trying to trick me into renewing my contract. They were trying to tell me I couldn't can't. I had to give them all. I, I basically had to send them the deed to my new house. And some GPS coordinates showing that my house does not fall in their service area. Um, and thankfully now I'm with a service. Um, it's a local telephone company, which I haven't been the biggest fan of in the past. But thanks to um, a lot of government grants and also government threats, I, I have um, fairly inexpensive uh, fiber optic service. And I live I live on a farm in the sticks, um, which is pretty great. So this is something – there's one thing I wish the government actually would invest a little bit more in, in terms of infrastructure, um, in terms of something that's actually um, doable and help a lot of people and advance the country forward. But that's another show. <laughs> no, you, I, you're right, and, and it probably is another show. But it it kind of goes hand in hand with the whole cord cutting thing and and our increasing dependence on on broadband um, and connectivity. Uh, I mean, okay, so. I'm not sure I really care to drive a 65-inch TV over broad or um, over wireless, but I can. You know, it's it's. I mean, it's not going to be the best experience, but you can do it. So I, I, I don't know. To circle back to the Apple TV, though, overall as an experience, because I know you said you had a Fire Stick, and I think you you also uh, pre-show you said you had a Chromecast. Just bought one. Well, Just, I have one built in my TV, but. Okay, so we have Roku. You have Roku. You have Comcast. Sorry, you have Roku. You have Chromecast. You have Fire, and you have the Apple TV. Right. How how would you compare and contrast the experiences with each? Hmm. Um, well, Fire TV is garbage. Um, I don't recommend it to anybody. <laughs> it's just, I just don't. I bought a Fire Stick for twenty five bucks as a Black Friday deal, um, just just to experiment with and mostly to sideload stuff Amazon doesn't want you to have. Um, and it just sucks. It's slow. Well, actually, the first one didn't work at all. And it took forever with support to finally convince them that, no, it doesn't work. I just get a black screen every time. Um, they sent me a new one. That one works. But it's, just, it's slower than Christmas. It's not very fun to use. Um, uh, maybe the one more expensive ones would be better. I don't know. I don't really care. Um, so Roku is pretty good. I actually don't have a Roku. My in-laws, um, have the Roku TV and they liked it so much. I got my Roku box for another TV. Um, and I've had really good experiences with that. So I, I would definitely put that in the, in the top circle, um, you know, top three, whatever you want to call that, um, winner circle. There you go. There, there's a, there's a good analogy. Um, the Chromecast, well, uh, uh, let me step back. So Android TV uh, is mostly garbage. 
I've heard really good things about the NVIDIA Shield, which is a $200 box that runs Android TV and it plays some games and other weird stuff. I'm going to tell you the problem with Android TV. Android TV would be um, potentially kind of genius if um, the built-in Chromecast feature worked correctly. So here's kind of the weird thing. So you can Chromecast to an Apple, to an Android TV device, but the problem is some things don't work. For instance, Netflix, you cannot Chromecast Netflix to Android TV for, for some reason. And it's a known issue, and it's because Netflix did something weird, and they refused to fix it, and Google can't make them fix it. And so Google's just like, I don't know, buy a Chromecast, I guess. So um, Android TV, I think, is kind of a non-starter, um, unless you're just stuck with it. Um, so Chromecast is kind of interesting. I just got one to play with because the one built in my TV doesn't work right. And uh, I, I can't figure the dang thing out. Like, I reviewed the first one for tidbits, but so I got a Chromecast Ultra. I can't figure out how to set that as the default uh, to receive uh, video. But anyway, so one of the things I like about the Chromecast is that the Google Home speakers can act as a tr Chromecast uh, transmitter. So you can say to your Google speaker, you can say, uh, and this is really cool if you pair it with YouTube TV, you can say, um, Google speaker, uh, turn on CNN, and it can do that. And it just turns your TV on and, and, change, and turns it to that channel. You can say, at least in theory, <laughs> you can say, uh, you know, play Stranger Things, and it can do that. Um, and, and that's something that just totally blew my mind. And, and a big part of the reason why I got the Chromecast, because I want to experiment with that side of things. And uh, Apple can't do that. But as a whole, in my, and I'm going to have to do a lot more experimentation before I give a real solid verdict on this. Um, Chromecast just kind of seems like a, a half finished solution. A lot, you know, I've had a lot of people tell me they need an interface on the TV. They it can't just be, I send stuff from my phone. And also a lot of times picking up something to watch is a shared, it's a communal experience, right? So you miss that with Chromecast unless people gather on like an iPad or something. Um, but I do love the idea of it. And, you know, it's a lot like airplay in some ways. But AirPlay, at least in its current form, is, is directly streaming, in most cases, from your device to the TV. And you lose quality. Uh, it's, it's kind of flaky. It's kind of unreliable. Chromecast, on the other hand, works by sending a URL to your device, at least in theory. And then the device itself pulls the content. So your, the Chromecast sending device um, isn't actually doing any work, which is why something like why a speaker can control your TV. So that's a pretty cool thing. Um, so if you have a Google Home or if you like you're in the Google system, um, you might want to look at the Chromecast. Um, so I would say right now that's sort of the, the top tier stuff. Apple TV is very good, although it has some – oh, let me cover Apple TV just since I'm giving pros and cons. Yeah, please. Um, Apple TV – um, I think has the, it has the best interface um, easily of all of these. Uh, although Roku has a very nice one, so yeah, hmm, yeah be, I, I, I kind of give Apple TV and Roku sort of a tie right now. Um, the Apple TV tends to be very fast. Um, Apple TV has excellent picture quality, although the built-in Android on on my sony tv i think gives just as good picture quality so that's i don't really think it's extra points there um the remote on the apple tv is garbage um it's terrible but the nice thing is is that you don't have to use it very much thanks to um hdmi cec and the fact the apple tv supports so many different kinds of remotes which is something i do cover in the book um so that's because so, uh, the biggest con with the apple tv i think well, the biggest pro is I think it has the most compatibility because you can play your Google stuff, you can play your iTunes stuff. You can't play iTunes and anything else. But now Apple TV can do iTunes, it can do Amazon, it can do Google because uh, you can watch like if you have Google Play movies, you can watch them through the YouTube app. Not a lot of people know that. Um, it supports all the major streaming services that I know of, like all these new over the top services and all that. Like for instance, DirecTV Now is on fire tv but it's not on android tv for instance for whatever strange reasons so um it has the most compatibility the the biggest downside i think with apple tv right now is the price the price is absurd for a 1080p box it's 150 bucks for the 4k box it starts at 1 
80, or really, I should say 149 and 179 to be precise, but still too dang much. And in fact, I did not buy an Apple TV 4K until DirecTV Now had a deal where you got one. If you paid, if you prepaid for three months of service, you got a, a free Apple TV 4K. So after, it's 115 bucks after tax. And so I got three months of, you know, TV service and uh, I, got my, I got an Apple TV 4K. That's a pretty good deal. Um, and if the Apple TV 4K were 100 bucks, or even maybe 120 125 I could be a lot more excited about it. But for $180, eh, it's, it's hard to recommend. And really, I, I've pushed a lot of people toward a Roku. And uh, if they're really Google heavy, I might suggest a Chromecast. Um, you know, so it's it's hard to recommend the Apple TV 4K at this point. Um, it's just so expensive. <laughs> I, you know, I, I have to disagree with you on that. Um, the Roku interface, and I'm, and, and I'm just going to discount the Fire and the Chromecast completely because I've I've worked with them, and you said one very interesting thing: the interfaces do not feel fast. And it, for, for someone who, I mean, most of us are used to being able to channel surf, you know, hit the button and the next channel comes up. And so it gets super frustrating very quickly. And I know these are first world problems, folks, but at the end of the day, it's the experience. Because when I sit down to watch something on those rare occasions that I sit down and want to watch something on TV, I don't want to have to try to figure out how to do it. And I certainly don't want to be waiting for it to happen. Mm-hmm. But the Apple TV and the Roku interface definitely feel more more finished. I find the Roku interface, I don't know, it just, I guess I feel like maybe I'm just not familiar enough with it. But it always feels like I have trouble finding what I'm looking for because there's so much stuff there. Mm -hmm. So depending on your bent, I mean, if you have somewhere you want to go, then it can be a hassle. If you know where you, if you just are messing around, well, yeah, let's see what, you know, this looks like a different channel. Let's see what's on there. Mm. Um, but the Apple TV it feels like a finished product and, and a product that's developing. And I, that's the part, I guess, that I value as much as anything with it. Um, and I, I'm delighted to see more of the video sources I want come to it and video services because it just edges you that much cl closer to cord cutting or if you've already cut the cord or trimmed down your cord to the basics and that's where I am, that I don't feel like I'm, I'm left out in the cold nearly as much. And I really, really appreciate that about it. But the other thing I wanted to ask you to touch on um, and expound on a little bit, um, I'm not sure I agree with you completely on the Apple TV remote because as I've – yeah, it took a little while to get used to it. But once I got used to it, as long as I'm not having to key something in with, with you know letters, I mean that's a hassle, no question about it. But otherwise, moving around has I've, – I've come to feel like it's pretty natural. I would say you're probably a minority opinion, Chuck. <laughs> Well, it won't be the first time, Josh. <laughs> I, I hear complaints. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I understand. I'm usually the minority opinion. Um, I hear complaints about it constantly. I, I, I'll tell you, though, um, you know, a lot of people made fun of the fact that the 4K um, just put that little white circle around the menu button. And, um, you know, oh, that's your big improvement. I will say it seems to have actually improved it somewhat in terms of having more tactile feel of the remote. Um, because it's not just a, a ring, it's actually like a, a ridge around that button. Um, my biggest problem, I hate the little touchpad because I click it and I stroke it. That didn't sound right, but I, I'm constantly manipulating it without wanting to. Uh, and, and, you know, you can just be sitting there and I don't know, you brush your hand. Oh, and why is, why is my TV going haywire? I think that's the biggest um, indictment of the mm -hmm. Apple TV remote. And I think the reason the Apple TV remote is so bad is because they wanted to try, and, and God bless them for trying to f figure this out, Apple wanted to try to make a device that could work as a TV remote and on some level as a game controller. Um, that doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Um, TV remotes and game controllers, if they're good at their jobs, it's for diametrically opposed reasons. Another another counterexample of that is my PlayStation 4, um, which is now sitting in a drawer because I don't have time to play the games for it. Really, I don't have time to install a 5-gigabyte update every time I fire the thing up, um, which it demands you do. 
But as a Blu-ray player, it's awful because, um, again, it needs an update constantly because Sony is super paranoid about piracy. But then um, trying to use the PlayStation remote uh, controller as uh, a play as a remote control is awful because you have these giant triggers that are really meant for, you know, it's like a gun trigger or like an accelerator for a race car, but they get hung on stuff constantly. And so you move the thing around. Oh, now you're fast forwarding. You don't know why. And you have to figure out how to fix that. So we got a cheap Sanyo, which is a, a Walmart brand, um, you know, an off brand. We got a cheap Sanyo Blu-ray player and we hooked it up and it supports HDMI CEC. Let me tell you, that thing's amazing. I just switched to the input. It's on input two. I think I go to input two. It turns it turns the the player on the remote for the for the Blu-ray player is awful, but it doesn't matter because it because it's perfectly compliant with HDMI CEC. So I, I switch that input; it works. All the buttons on my Sony TV remote control the Blu-ray player. I never have to update it. I never have to worry about putting in a disc and it not appearing and, and until I download you know another five gigabyte update. So anyway, um, in this long rambling uh, paragraph I've, I've got going on here, <laughs> what were we originally talking? We're, oh, yeah, we're talking about the remotes, right? Yeah. So, so I did touch on the remote thing. So I think that's one of the things, too, is increasingly um, how much a remote is, how good a remote is doesn't matter because you do have this HDMI CEC technology, which lets you um, control things with different remotes which is cool. And it's also why I've kind of come to the conclusion that I think ultimately something like Chromecast is the future because, Hey, with Chromecast, you never have to worry about your TV interface because there isn't one. Um, you don't have to worry about the remote design because again, there isn't one it's, it's all on your phone. You know how to use your phone. Um, and also, um, very dumb devices can be Chromecast transmitters, like, for instance, a speaker that you talk to. So, um, or even, you know, one of those cheap Chrome, uh, Chromebooks or just anything. Um, I mean, you could even, in theory, have a remote control that has Chromecast built into it that can, you know, send content to uh, the TV like that. So I think ultimately... That's what we're going to move more toward and less away from these having 10 different boxes hooked up to your TV, each with its own interface. I think the Chromecast way is the way to go. I, I wish Google honestly would get their act more together because if Android TV weren't such a hot mess, um, I think they'd be running laps around everyone else. It's fortunate for the rest of the tech industry that Google doesn't care that much about a lot of this stuff. They're they're too busy, I don't know, trying to figure out how to freeze your brain in a jar or something. Because um, <laughs> if they really got serious about music and they got serious about TV with all the data they have and all the, the different um, synchronicities they have going on and the fact they don't scare the crap out of content providers that the way Apple does, they could run laps around everyone. But, you know, fortunately for Apple, Google just doesn't care. They'd rather, I don't know, put frozen brains on the moon or whatever it is they're up to these days. I, uh, I, I can't decide if you're a traitor to the Apple brand or if you really believe this stuff. Um, because, <laughs> because I, I mean, Google, of all people, you know, I just don't find what they're doing as, as finished. I, listen, I, and at the end it's of the fine. day – and at the end of the day, we're tech people, and 90% of the people, probably closer to 98% of the people that are going to see this, are tech people. Mm -hmm. And there is still a lot, with all these devices, there's still a lot of tech setup and arrangements to figure out how to make it work. And I think mm -hmm. that may be another one of the things that I like about the Apple TV, and to a little bit lesser extent about the Roku. The Roku is built into my TV, whether I use mm -hmm. it or not. Um, the Apple TV, yeah, it's a box I have to plug in, but I feel like it's it's a finished architecture that, at least to me as an Apple user, makes sense. Most of the stuff that I want to watch or would want to watch is available through it, mm -hmm. and there's a lot less setup involved. I, I mean, okay, okay, so we can argue of the remote as to whether we, you know, you like it or I don't. Or, or vice versa. But at the end of the day, I plug an Apple TV in, I set the HDMI input to the right thing, and I've got a remote that I can maneuver around with and pick my sources. Mm -hmm. And that's it. 
Well, bear in mind, first of all, going back to the, the trader comment, bear in mind, I'm trying to sell a book here. So it's very much in my interest for you to buy an Apple TV. Um, now, I, I will say this. I, I, will, uh, so I will say something else controversial. Gene Munster was right the entire time. Remember, they used to, it used to be an ongoing joke. Every investor call, he would ask about an Apple TV set, yeah. and everyone would laugh at him. He was 100% right. Because that's if Apple were serious about this space, truly serious, that's what they should do. Instead of stupid boxes, look, I've had a huge troubleshooting issue trying to get um, 4K HDR to work between my Apple TV 4K and my Sony TV. That's um, probably another show. That's, uh, that's probably probably going to be a, a Tibbetts article very soon. Um, what needs to ha- – Apple just needs – to release a TV. It's just a giant iPad. Maybe it comes with a HomePod if you want a surround speaker, or maybe you can buy a HomePod as a surround speaker. And you don't have to, you know, because you have to calibrate every TV. You have to calibrate them. Um, they're getting better about looking good out of the box. Those TCLs look quite good out of the box, and they don't need a lot of calibration. But still, you, you shouldn't even have to do it. You don't have to calibrate an iPad. You've never calibrated an iPad. I'm not even, even sure you can calibrate an iPad. Um, you know, a Mac, oh, it's a smaller screen. Okay, I'm staring at a 27-inch iMac. I don't have to, well, you can calibrate it, I guess, but it's not usually necessary to get decent colors um, and, and get a decent picture. So app, an actual Apple TV set, you set, you know, you set the thing up. I mean, in fact, you could set up with your iPhone, just touch your iPhone to it, and it just does everything automatically. And then you don't have to worry about whether you got the right HDMI cable. That's an issue now I've learned. You don't have to worry about whether you have the right HDMI ports. You don't have to worry about um, you know these weird conflicts that are coming up between the boxes and the smart TVs now. Um, you can tell I've had a lot of problem getting the HDR thing to work. You know, it just it just <laughs> works. You just turn it on. You sign into your a- a- Apple ID, and it just works. And uh, it's it's all in one thing. Isn't that what Apple's always been about? That's always been the the, the Apple dream, right? You just you, your computer. You don't have a, a box and a screen. You bring home a computer, an iMac or a Mac Classic or whatever. You have an iPhone, an iPad. They're all just one thing. You know, that's what the Apple TV should be. It should be a TV set. I, listen, I would love it. I I think yeah. I mean there there are probably eight or ten good reasons that they don't do it, not the least of which is that the the margins for TV sets are not great, and people are going to go out and say I can buy what to your point the three ninety nine TCL, and mm-hmm. I'll jump through a few more hoops. But you know to Apple would want you know fifteen hundred or or better for something like that, and so people aren't going to do it. You know I mean they. There would be some of us that would, because we would understand the value of it. But you know, a lot of people. I mean, let's face it, Josh. A lot of people aren't that discerning about their TVs. You know, they're. It'd be like trying to sell a three hundred fifty dollars speaker. Well, <laughs> yeah, and that could be in a whole nother show. Um, <laughs> you know, yeah. Let's leave that because that that's going to take us. <laughs> we'll be here all evening, Josh. I, I think Apple could do it. I think honestly, the main reason is not the price or the commoditization. I think the main thing is because, you know, how big is a TV box? You know, big. You know, how big is an Apple TV fork? Actually, hold on. I was going to do a thing with my hands, but look. Here, I got right here. This is how big an Apple TV box is. You know, now how many more do you think you can cram on a truck? It's not very hard. (laughs) Not hard math here. You know, this, you probably put 10,000 of these into a truck where you could put maybe you know, two or 300, you know, 55 inch TVs. Um, and of course, Tim Cook is a bean counting supply chain guy. So I think that's where a lot, a lot of the calculation comes down to. And also, I don't think Apple wants to be in a position where they have to decide which sizes to offer and all this and that. So I think that's why they stick to the box. I really think that if they're serious about this and they want to have a, a real solution, it needs to be a TV set. Because, you know, just as someone who doesn't get to watch a lot of TV, I get tired of fooling with the stupid thing. I mean, I like the technology, you know, and I like – in a way, I like having problems because it's something to write about. But just as a per- guy who wants to sit down and watch something, I don't want to mess with it. You know, I've had so many problems with this HDR thing, and it's probably another show. But, like, you know, <laughs> I try to watch a movie and so I get weird lines on my screen and, you know – it's, it just doesn't work anymore. It's not all just working like it used to. Um, so, yeah, they just they need to make a set if yeah. they're serious about this. I I, I would love it. I, I think you know the other argument too is that we can take that little 
the 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 Apple TV that comes out of little box that you just pointed out. I can hook it to my TCL. I can hook it to a Samsung. I can hook it to a sure. Sony. I can hook it, you know, to anything. And if that's the environment I'm working in, then I can turn any set, no matter how expensive or how cheap, into the same thing. Sure. And and that. That has a lot of appeal to me. Okay, I'm going to trade up my TCL to you know a a, a three thousand dollars Sony or you know some of the ten thousand dollars monitors I saw at CES, and you know great, I that'll be my new experience. The the screen will look better, the picture will look better, arguably, um, and that depends on the on the on the box. But the mm -hmm. Apple TV environment remains the same, and. You know that I think there's something compelling about that solution too, plus the fact that even at a hundred and what one was one seventy nine for the top end, um, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, that's a lot of money compared to the others. But you and I just finished saying that, with the exception of the uh, the Roku, the others we can't recommend. They're garbage, and so you know, yeah, I, I so I can pay twenty five or thirty bucks for garbage. I, I can pay twenty. Let me right. do this. I can pay twenty five or thirty bucks for garbage, or I can pay one seventy nine and get a quality experience. I'm right. going to go for the uh, one seventy nine all the time. But you know which one's more popular by a long shot. Well, yeah, sure. <laughs> and, and there's a, and there's a certain hamburger chain that se sells a whole lot of hamburgers, but nobody's going to argue that they're the best hamburgers. No, no. <laughs> but you know, the point being, and it's funny. Um, I, I've got I have a lot of uh, redneck friends and just norm, normal non techy people. Are like, hey, you heard about this Fire Stick? You can hack and put stuff on. It's this huge thing. You can and there's YouTube uh, tutorials on this. You, you get you a cheap Fire Stick, and you you can sideload apps on it. And people have made these software packages where. It's basically a whole alternate universe. It's like a pirate universe of of stuff like this. And it's like, oh, hey, you want to watch all these movies there in the theater? You want to watch a UFC fight that's on right now? It's all in one one screen. It's wild. It's crazy. Um, but that's really – we talk about the mass market. And this is kind of the thing um, people in the tech world don't really like talking about, partially because – like Wired ran an article on one of these things, and it almost immediately got shut down. But but something always but something always springs up. I mean, and that's really you want to talk about the the real popular consumer market. You know, if we want to get really real, because people don't have money for all this TV crap. You know, you and me are pretty lucky. We can buy hundred and eighty dollar TV boxes and then buy content on top of it. You know, a lot for a lot of people. Hey, the twenty five dollar stick, and that's all you need. That's the way they're going. You know, so yeah. we're, we're serving niche of a niche. Um, but now, see, I would argue, though, you know, I'm not sure Apple TV is the best experience. Um, I, I think I think if you're in the Apple ecosystem, um, it probably is your safe choice. Uh, I don't you know, I don't think anyone's going to regret, uh, you know, if you if you if you have all Apple stuff, you're not going to say, well, why I get the stupid Apple TV. It's going to be just another Apple thing. You paid a little too much for it, but it works pretty well. And, then, you know, it looks good. Um you know, but in terms of, you know, if you're not so strictly Apple, you know, you might want to look at the Roku. You might want to look at um, at some of these other things, um, you know. But, yeah, the two main ones I would recommend at this point are Roku and Apple TV. Um, I am reconsidering Chromecast mostly because I can uh, control it with my voice, with, you know, without touching anything. Which is something I, I really wish Apple TV. If Apple TV had that with the HomePod, I would be much more excited right now. Um, I, I think that, and that's something they could totally do. Um, so uh, let me see, let me see if uh, my Google Home will let me do this. Okay, Google, play Stranger Things on the TV, please. It's not going to respond. <laughs> also, need to know which device. Oh, okay. Is. Try saying that again oh. and include the device's name. Okay, Google, play Stranger Things on my Chromecast Ultra. Sure, Stranger Things from Netflix. Play so, it on Chromecast Ultra. In theory, it's turning on my TV and playing and playing the first episode of Stranger Things right now um, in 4K. I wish I could do something like that with the Apple TV. Um, and, and see, that's the kind of high-tech stuff you really expect Apple to be doing. Um, so that, that's a slight disappointment. I know every other way though, I think Chromecast is probably a mess, but hold on. Okay. Google stop playing on my Chromecast ultra. Okay. Google stop playback. 
nothing's playing right now. <laughs> Okay, so I'll have to turn the TV off here in a second. But you see, I'm glad it's working so well, Josh. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, it's your typical Google experience. Yeah, and 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 by the way, I did notice that you said please, which just kind of blows my mind. So one thing, one thing, I, I am very polite, Chuck. And one thing I like about Google Assistant, if I say please to Siri, she gets super confused. I, and see, Google understands. And given that Google has invested in the past heavily into killer robots, I'm going to be very polite to their <laughs> AI. <laughs> okay, that's an angle I hadn't thought about. That's an angle I hadn't thought about. So you this this is an update to take control of Apple TV. Um, yes. And so if you have an Apple TV, go get it. If you if you are thinking about getting an Apple TV, this might be a good place to start before you invest in the Apple TV, and then after you get it, of course, you'll have it. Um, this is since this is an upgrade, Josh. It's it's a free update for existing um, users. Uh, what's the price of the book if if you're brand new to the book? I believe it's fifteen dollars if you're brand new. If you if you're still stuck on the first edition for some reason, um, it's less expensive. I couldn't tell you exactly how much off the top of my head. And then uh, if you have uh, the second edition, which came out uh, a year or two ago, uh, it's a free update. So definitely don't want to miss that. Okay, great. Um, we got to have you back when we talk killer robots and, you know, what, <laughs> what, whether you actually got the, the Google Home to stop playing Stranger Things. Uh, <laughs> it's it to be an episode of Stranger Things with the killer robots. Oh, good. <laughs> It's good to see you, Josh. Thanks so much. Thanks, Chuck. We'll, we'll talk again soon. Folks, I'm Chuck Joyner. This is Mac Voices. This is one of those cases where Josh and I just may have to disagree a bit, but at least he still likes the Apple TV enough to write about it. So there's a lot to be said for that. Until the next time, thanks for watching. <laughs>